Now, a couple months ago, Sony let me borrow the Sony Venice. Now, if you guys aren't familiar with the Sony Venice, it's one of the best and also one of the most expensive cameras in their lineup. And I got to use it for the last three weeks, and I actually learned a lot while operating on this camera. Uh, some things that actually have made me think of my cinematography and filmmaking a bit differently, and some things that actually made me really happy with the things or the situation that I already have. Uh, we'll get to it. Now, the first thing that I learned about using the Sony Venice over the course of just under a month is if you think you're going to use all the accessories that you might have used on an FX3 or an FX6 or another smaller camera, you might be disappointed because a lot of those things aren't going to end up being used. Now, the Sony Venice, for as good as it is, has an entirely different workflow. It's a much bigger camera. It has different I.O. on it. It has a different format entirely. So a lot of things like that gimbal that you really like or that slider that you really like, it's not going to apply here. In in fact, a lot of the things that you'll use on the Venice outside of handheld are going to cost you a little bit of money. You're going to need to use an easy rig if you don't want to destroy your back. If you want gimbal movement, you're not looking at a Ronin RS3 Pro. You're looking at something that's going to be much bigger and much more robust. Uh, finding accessories for your camera is going to be difficult. However, when you go up to the level of a Sony Venice, it becomes even more so. At the very least, it becomes more expensive. Now, having a big rig and having a bunch of accessories to suit your camera, it actually takes a village to raise a child but it also takes a community in order for you to operate something like a sony venice or a bigger cinema camera now they do have something called the camera department at the higher levels of film and commercial production and there's a reason why it's an actual department instead of just being yourself shooting solo on something like the system to get the most out of the sony venice you're going to have to get a bunch of accessories but oftentimes they're really hard to actually set up by yourself you're going to need something like a camera assistant in order to help you balance your gimbal or change out your lens is because you're hooked up into an easy rig and you don't have the opportunity to. If you need a tripod that could fit that payload, you're gonna need someone to help you out with that. And sometimes you actually might see people on dolly tracks while they're using a bigger setup. And all those things are going to require other people. It's very hard to do that on your own. So when you are working with this camera, it's sort of a system where you do need more than one person more often than not. And that's something that I started to learn the hard way. Now, the way that I set up these shoots was mostly just to test and play around with the camera. And I did a couple of projects that I finished up, but one part of that is that when you're working on a smaller budget or no budget at all, it's actually hard to get the resources and the human capital in order to help you operate the camera. Now, one thing that I did acknowledge beforehand and I realized earlier on while using the Sony Venice is that you want to get on point with your lighting. You can honestly make any camera look really good and really professional as long as your lighting is going to be on point. Now, there are certain situations like dynamic range or certain things in color science that might look a little bit different or better, but when you're working with a higher end camera, you want to put it in situations where you're going to be lighting and you're actually going to be thinking about the shots that you have rather than just run and gunning. Oftentimes if you don't have great lighting or great location or great composition, even when you're shooting on something like the Sony Venice, you, you can still have images that might look the same as if you're shooting on a Sony FX3. And honestly, that's just the truth. What's going to end up happening is you're going to get hyped up on the fact that you have all this resolution and all this power. But if you're just throwing the camera around willy nilly, honestly, you could have something like the Sony FX30 that could look very much like the Sony Venice. Actually, we did that before. Now, piggybacking off of that, another thing that you want to consider when you're going up into a higher rank of cinema cameras is if you don't need all the things from an I.O. perspective, you might not actually need the camera at all. We've gotten to a certain place where every single camera looks good. We have mirrorless cameras that can do 6K. We have mirrorless cameras that can record in RAW. We have pocket-sized cameras for under $2,000 that can make amazing image quality. At a certain point, this camera is more about the workflow than the pixels that are inside of the sensor. And if you're not gonna use all the IO out of your camera, you're not gonna use it for that particular workflow, like the multiple SDIs and all the other things that are going to be on the Sony Venice, you actually might be better off with a smaller camera that's going to be a little bit more compact and a little bit easier to use. Now, as much as I loved using the Sony Venice, I love the image coming out of it, I love its color and its dynamic range and everything that it can do, I would never buy this camera. I think it'd be something that I would rent. Now, for me personally, I'm not there in my cinematography journey that I'm going to need a camera like the Sony Venice on a regular basis. If anything, I'm probably great on a Sony FX3 anyways. I just like to use different things for a little bit easier of a workflow. If you're somebody that is working up at the level where you have larger budgets, oftentimes you don't necessarily need to own the big camera. You don't have to have it in your house. If you're living in an area with more active production in general, oftentimes you're gonna find yourself in your rental houses where you could always just go and borrow the camera and put it under the client's budget 
budget rather than you having to buy it yourself. At a certain level in filmmaking, some DPs don't own any gear at all. Some of them will just rent stuff out and build that to the client and then that becomes the camera they use on certain projects. And if you're somebody that doesn't necessarily need the Sony Venice all the time, as for someone that loves it a lot and loves the image and loves what it can do, I wouldn't recommend spending $60,000 in purchasing this if you're not going to use it often. Now, today's video is going to be sponsored by Audio. Now, one of the problems I did have and the failures I had when creating some of these projects with the Venice was I didn't think about the music that I wanted before. Now, with Audio, I've actually started to make some playlists of tracks that I actually really like and I actually want to use. However, Audio does two things really, really well. One, you're actually able to search from a variety of different genres and different moods and even beats per minute in terms of the songs you're looking for. And two is going to be their memberships. Right now, if you want to save 70% off your first year of audio, you could actually use the link in the description down below. I'm going to leave a code on the screen and you're only going to have to pay 60 bucks for the first year of using music licensing and sound effects for your next video project. That being said, a special shout out to audio. If you guys do want to have an amazing library of tracks and sound effects and save a whole bunch of money, click the link in the description down below. Make sure you use my code and uh, let's get back to the video. Now, my biggest lesson and arguably my biggest failure with this entire experience is don't shoot the Sony Venice like you would the Sony FX6. You have to treat different cameras differently with a different workflow. Even if you're used to something previous and it's familiar, you have to keep that in mind. Now, one of the biggest things that I had with this experience is I thought I can do everything. I thought I was going to shoot multiple commercials and multiple projects in the three weeks that I had with this camera on virtually no budget and crew that might not be experienced in working in this workflow and me just bringing whatever lights that I had wherever I could. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. When using the Sony FX6 or when I use my Sony FX30, I could pull up to a shoot and I could start to figure things out and still make something pretty decent. But because of the workflow on the Venice, in order to get the thing I need to get, things are going to take longer. And even when you want the most out of the setup, you're going to have to do things before you press record. That's the pre-production and making sure your locations are on point and make sure you have everything you need, make sure you have experienced personnel. And sometimes you can't do that for multiple projects in the span of less than a month. I managed to get out one project where I tried to copy the style of an Under Armour commercial, and I'm still working on the sound design and getting everything through it. However, I did realize very quickly that I couldn't do multiples of these in the span of a couple of weeks. It's going to take me longer and I have to be more intentional and more methodical with what I'm doing in terms of shooting on a system like this in order to get the most out of it. But that being said, I learned a ton using the Sony Venice. I learned how to actually slow myself down, even though I'd learned it the hard way. I learned that you can't just manhandle the camera and shoot handheld for everything, even though it looks cool, because sometimes you might not get the shots that you need. Uh, I also learned that you need a village in order to be able to do this. And when I move up into that next step in my filmmaking, I'm going to have to have crew members and people that I rely on in order to do that. But ultimately, I learned that this camera is too much for me. And that might be something that's hard to admit for some people, but I'm willing to accept that if I'm using a system that I'm not quite ready for, use it for what it is and learn how to operate on it, but understand that you're gonna have to give it back and it might not be something that you wanna spend your money on right this second. However, I have been testing a couple of cameras as of late. I wanna see new workflows. I wanna try new things. I wanna be able to get my hands on everything because I wanna see how it fits into my workflow because I do feel kind of like inside that there's going to be another step in terms of what I'm doing and I want to make sure that I pick the right tools for those right jobs. That being said, if you guys did enjoy this video or you did learn a couple of things using a more expensive camera system, uh, leave a like or a comment down below. It's always really cool interacting with you guys in the comments. And I know there's another thing that I haven't talked about yet. I'll probably talk about it in the next video, but for now, see you in the next one. Peace.